بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا يا كريم Dear colleagues, now we are going to discuss a new subject in the musculoskeletal imaging which uh, will be about the uh, diagnosis of uh, musculoskeletal infections. And this will involve the infection of the bone, infection of the joints, as well as infection of the muscles and the related uh, subcutaneous and uh, uh, subcutaneous tissues and the facial glands. And here are the uh, uh, topics that we uh, would like to cover in this uh, in this topic and 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 we'll start by the inflammation of the skin and uh, this is known as uh, cellulitis which is an acute infection of the uh, dermis and the subcutaneous uh, tissues and um, this is not uh, an uh, infectious disease that can be transmitted from one to another. It is uh, uh, related to, to uh, the presence of uh, some infective organisms in the subcutaneous tissues, especially uh, known in patients with uh, diabetes because they uh, have the uh, peripheral uh, vascular uh, disease and the nourishment of the skin and the, the subcutaneous tissues is relatively poor and this will uh, uh, lead to uh, the susceptibility of uh, inflammatory changes. Uh, actually, the diagnosis of uh, cellulitis is easy from the clinical point of view, but uh, sometimes you may need to look for the possible uh, complications. One of the uh, best imaging modalities here is ultrasound. It is of course rapid and uh, at the same time it is a dynamic examination and uh, whenever you have the ultrasound and you got some echogenicity of the uh, skin and the haziness of the subcutaneous tissues with edema in the subcutaneous tissues which will uh, give the cobblestone appearance and uh, also you may see hypoechoic or anechoic bands of fluid in the uh, subcutaneous tissues as you can see here. The complications of cellulitis include deep extension of the infection, the formation of soft tissue abscesses, extension of the infection to the underlying muscles. If the infection is aggressive, it may lead to a necrotizing fasciitis. Also, if it reaches the bone, it may lead to osteomyelitis. And whenever infection is near to uh, vessels, it may lead to uh, thrombophilic uh, bites. Then we uh, uh, came to this uh, very important issue which is the osteomyelitis which means that uh, there is infection of the bone as well as of the medullary cavity and this is typically occurred by uh, bacteria it can affect uh, any age and uh, the most common age group to be affected are between 2 and 12 years of age and uh, there is some uh, male predilection. Uh, in most of the cases, the bacteria or the organism reaches the bone by hematogenous spread through the bloodstream. But uh, sometimes this may occur by direct extension, secondary to trauma, or even previous uh, surgery, or the presence of skin ulcers that may uh, uh, transmit the infection to the underlying bone. Staphylococcal aureus is the most common 
uh, pathogen which can be uh, isolated in about 90% of the cases. However, in up to 50% of the cases, no organisms could, uh, can be recovered. And uh, the location of the osteomyelitis has uh, some uh, age uh, distribution and the, in the neonates, it uh, affects the metaphysis and or the epiphysis, while in the children, it predominantly affects the metaphysis. In adults, there is epiphyseal affection and the subchondral extension. Then uh, that's what happens if the organism reaches the, the bone and uh, the nutrient arteries are uh, considered as end arteries. When, whenever the bacteria came through the uh, nutrient artery, they will initiate an acute inflammatory uh, response that will result in tissue necrosis and a breakdown, leading to obstruction of the vessel and uh, consequently a vascular necrosis of the affected bone leading to dead bone which is known as the sequestrum and this will end by the stage of chronic osteomyelitis before the formation of uh, necrotic tissue sequestra and this is known the acute stage and uh, after the necrosis sequestration and uh, new bone formation which is known as infolicrum and this is the chronic stage as I will discuss. Then the, the early sign of uh, acute osteomyelitis is the changes in the uh, soft tissues adjacent to the affected bone which may became, became a swollen and sometimes you may notice that there is blurring of the fat planes around the bone or near the joint to be affected. And sometimes, uh, because most of the uh, inflammatory changes are near to the joint in the epiphysis or in the metaphysis, then you may, you may have a joint effusion of the nearby joint. And in order for the lesion to uh, appear in the brain X-ray, about 40% of the bone mineral uh, density has to be lost. And um, this may take some time which is uh, considered as a latent period between the time that the organism has reached the bone and the initial appearance of the uh, bony changes in the X-ray. This latent period is about seven days in children and about two weeks in adults. The changes that are uh, suspected to appear in the plain X-ray include regional osteoporosis or osteopenia, then uh, periosteal reaction and uh, osteolytic lesion of the affected bone, usually in the cortex, and uh, there may be some endosteal scalloping, then uh, the normal bony trabeculae are lost in the affected area, and after some time there may be new bone uh, a position and the peripheral sclerosis and in the chronic untreated cases you may got sequestrum, umbilicrum and cloaca as I will uh, show to you. Then this is the bacteria seeding uh, into the bone resulting in focal area of bone marrow cellulitis then inflammation will compromise the blood flow causing necrosis and infection is forced through the vascular channel into the cortex. This is the site of the entrance of the nutrient artery where the infection will uh, retrograde pass through the same uh, route into the uh, uh, subperiosteal area leading to periosteal elevation and subperiosteal newborn formation. The central part of the uh, bone will become necrotic and dead, and this is known as sequestrum. The periosteum will deposit new bone uh, uh, along the area uh, where it is uh, elevated, and this is known as uh, involucrum. And this is an example of acute osteomyelitis of the distal phalanx of the big two. 
and you can see this erosive changes which are uh, relatively ill-defined with uh, soft tissue swelling and you may be able to see some uh, air loculi within the uh, infected uh, area. And this is another example of hematogenous osteomyelitis of the distal part of the radius. And uh, in, um, within two weeks of presentation, you got some uh, erosive changes in the distal part of the radius. Then within three weeks, you may got uh, some uh, newborn formation. And uh, uh, in the course of about eight weeks, you got uh, considerable healing at the site of the, uh, of the infection. Then uh, uh, CT is considered uh, uh, somewhat uh, insensitive. It will show most of the uh, changes that appeared in the plain X-ray. But actually, there are some changes that will not be seen in the plain X-ray nor in the CT, particularly in the very early stage of bone marrow edema, where only MRI is able to see these changes within the bone. Then uh, uh, the, the CT may have low sensitivity and the specificity even in chronic cases. And uh, the limitations of CT are mainly due to its inability to detect the bone marrow edema. And uh, sometimes you may got uh, uh, artifacts from uh, metallic implants or uh, some foreign bodies. Then uh, bone marrow edema, which is the earliest sign of acute osteomyelitis, is seen only by MRI, and this can be detected as early as one to two days after the onset of infection. You do not need to wait for seven or 14 days. The bone marrow edema, as you all know, is of low signal in the T1 and high signal in the T2, and if you inject contrast, the bone marrow edema will enhance. And you remember my words that I always repeat, bone marrow edema of whatever etiology, either traumatic, inflammatory, degenerative, neoplastic, if you give contrast material, bone marrow edema will enhance of whatever etiology. And here you see a case of osteomyelitis of the proximal tibia where the plain X-ray looks absolutely normal. In MRI, you can see bone marrow edema in the, in the tibia. You see some breaching of the physial blade into the epiphysis. The bone marrow edema in the t 2 weighted image is uh, of bright signal. And this is an extensive case of acute osteomyelitis of the hind foot affecting mainly the uh, calcaneus and some of the tarsal bones. And you see the uh, erosive changes of the uh, of the calcaneus, but on MRI you can see how severe is uh, the disease. And there is extensive uh, destructive changes in the calcaneus and the uh, inflammatory granulation tissue in the surrounding uh, fat planes, and also you see the, the lesions that are a beard of bright signal in the T2 weighted image. And also in the axial image, and you can see the soft tissue inflammation, all what appears bright in this stir image represents uh, fluids in the soft tissues indicative of inflammation. Then um, in this case, you may see that this shoulder appears uh, of uh, uh, showing no abnormality actually, but uh, this patient had uh, an osteomyelitis and the, the ultrasound showed the, the presence of subosteal uh, fluid collection near the humeral metaphysis, which cannot be elicited in the plain X-ray. As I have mentioned before, that ultrasound is one of the uh, uh, good imaging modalities and it has a major role in the musculoskeletal imaging. Of course, bone scan in the indium labeled uh, white BC scintigraphy, gallium citrate, and uh, bit CT may uh, help in uh, localization of the uh, site of infection. But as you all know, that the findings are uh, non specific, 
because they may, may be secondary to trauma. This uh, uptake in uh, the regional uptake in the area, in the inflamed area, may, may, uh, may be also the, the sequelae of other underlying pathologies. Then in cases of chronic osteomyelitis, and you got this uh, appearance, you see uh, some holes in the, in the bones or let's say cavities, and these, uh, these cavities may contain uh, sclerotic bone uh, fragments, which represent the dead bone or the sequestra, and these cavities may be communicating to the uh, outside through openings, and these openings are known as cloaca, and sometimes the, these openings are uh, persistently discharging inflammatory uh, fluid or even bus, and you, you may need to perform this technique, which is known as uh, cyanography, in order to delineate the track where it is connected to uh, inside the uh, bone, bone in the medullary bone, where an abscess uh, cavity is uh, opacified. Another example of uh, chronic osteomyelitis, in where you got this uh, dense bone representing sequestra, the opening where the dense bone is uh, extruded through the medullary cavity is known as cloaca, and the new bone formation along the shaft of the bone is known as the omvulacrum. And this is a case of the fracture of the uh, femur, and, and there is also manifestations of chronic osteomyelitis in most of the distal part of the, of the femur, where you got the uh, uh, cavities within the bone, and you got dead bone representing sequestra, and also you, may get, you, you can see the dense uh, bone along the uh, shaft representing the subrostial new bone formation or the omvulacrum. Then these are the complications of uh, osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis may result in a sinus tract formation, the charging bust, may uh, sometimes superimposed by the development of a squamous cell carcinoma, which is known as margarine ulcer. And um, uh, osteomyelitis, the, the bone affected by osteomyelitis may be subjected to the, the possibility of developing an osteosarcoma, which is a rare possibility. Uh, there may be pathological fractures or uh, secondary amyloidosis. The differential diagnosis of uh, osteomyelitis, especially in the chronic phase, may include the charcot joint, we'll describe in detail, then uh, bone metastasis, even sarcoma, osteosarcoma, bone lymphoma, uh, maybe multiple myeloma, and uh, histiocytosis. And this is an example by MRI of an osteomyelitis in the distal part of the femur, where you got bone marrow edema, in the T1, bright in the T2. And if you look carefully, you can see a cavity within the bone marrow edema representing an abscess. And this abscess uh, contains the uh, proteinaceous uh, uh, fluid or bus, which is somewhat bright in the T1 and also bright in the T2, indicating the presence of uh, proteinaceous fluid. Then uh, you know that uh, fungal osteomyelitis is, uh, is also one of the bone infections, but is seen in uh, usually the immune uh, compromised patients. And uh, the most commonly encountered organism is the Candida albicans. And uh, it is, uh, if it is frequent, it will, uh, it will be seen uh, commonly in the, in the spine. And this is an example of uh, uh, fungal uh, spondylodiscitis, uh, where you got an inflammation of the uh, L23 intervertebral disc being bright in the T2-weighted image. And the bone marrow edema of the opposing vertebral in the blades they are black in the T1 and bright in the T2 or stair. And after injection of contrast in this T1 fat set image, you got enhancement of the bone marrow edema, enhancement of the inflamed disc, 
as well as enhancement of the inflammatory uh, granulation tissue. Actually, the fungal osteomyelitis is not uh, different uh, from the uh, uh, bacterial osteomyelitis in, um, uh, in its uh, uh, X-ray, CT, and MR appearance. And in MRI, you may see bone marrow edema, which is black in the T1 and bright in the T2. You may got bone erosive changes, and you may got extension to the, uh, to the joint. The fact that uh, fungus will appear of dark T2 signal is not uh, clearly identified here in the uh, infection of the bone. Then we came to the uh, broadest abscess, which is an intraosseous abscess and maybe uh, a sequelae of subacute bacterial osteomyelitis. This uh, abscess can occur at any location and any uh, patient age, and it, uh, it is usually uh, non-expansile, but sometimes if it is present in uh, a small bone, it may be an expanding, and it may have a sclerotic or non-sclerotic margin and may be associated with uh, some localized perosteal reaction. This broadest abscess commonly seen in uh, children and uh, the staph aureus is the most common uh, organism also as uh, the, uh, the case in, in osteomyelitis. The lesion occurs in the metaphysis of the tubular bones and the most common sites are the proximal and distal ends of the tibia. The carpal uh, and the tarsal bones may be affected, but extension across the gross plate is rare. This abscess uh, may uh, extend across the gross plate, but the plate, if the plate is open, uh, there is, uh, according to the literature, maybe the extension is not come then this the the abscess appears in an osteolytic lesion and uh, it is uh, surrounded by a sick ring of uh, reactive uh, bone sclerosis and this sign which is a lucent line extending towards the growth blade before epiphyseal closure is uh, considered by the literature as pathognomonic for uh, broadest abscess as I have mentioned, sometimes you got with osteal neobog formation and you may got uh, some soft tissue swelling adjacent to the affected bone. Then I will uh, tell you about this uh, penumbra sign. Then here you see that what I mean, a lucent uh, line which is extending from the lesion towards the, uh, the gross blade. And this penumbra sign is a high signal intensity rim and the T1 weighted image surrounding the abscess cavity and uh, it, it is just a sign and you can see here this is what we mean by the penumbra sign where uh, you got an abscess inside the distal part of the femur and um, the, and the T1 before contrast in injection and you got this uh, bright signal in the T1 weighted image. And these are two uh, broadest abscesses, one in the distal uh, part of the femoral metaphysis, and uh, the other is in the proximal part of the tibial uh, metaphysis. And this is also another example of uh, broadest abscess that is crossing the physial blade, and um, the, you can see the extensive surrounding uh, bone marrow edema and the lesion is of low signal in the T1, high signal in the T2, and if you inject contrast material, this abscess, the, the edema will enhance, and also you may be able to see some periosteal fluid uh, collection along the distal part of the shaft of the femur. And this uh, particular example of broadest abscess in the distal part of the femur, and you see the cavity, and you see that there is some cortical breaching or erosion where the inflammatory material is coming outside the confinement of the 
uh, of the medullary cavity with consequent the de development of uh, some synovial effusion in the uh, knee joint. Then we came to what is known as sclerosing osteomyelitis of Gary, and this is a specific type of chronic osteomyelitis usually seen in children and young adults. It uh, uh, can affect the mandible and um, associated with uh, odontogenic uh, infection and uh, if it affects the lung bones there is overgrowth of the bone on the outer surface of the cortex giving the appearance of an onion skin or an onion peel uh, 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 considerable uh, cortical thickening and this is not a perosteal reaction but there is continuous cortical uh, the thickening and this is an example of a sclerosing osteomyelitis of Garrier. And here you can, you can see the uh, fulminant cortical thickening and the loss of the corticomedullary differentiation. Of course, this is completely different from Ewing sarcoma, for example, where you got lamellated berosti reaction and you got a destructive lesion within the medullary cavity of the bone and may be as associated with abnormal uh, soft tissue swelling in the uh, surrounding uh, soft tissues. And this is uh, an example in the mandible. There is uh, some uh, increase in the size of the mandible with uh, uh, thick thickening of the cortex. And this is of low signal in the T1 and uh, bright signal in the in the T2 weighted image and you can appreciate the difference between the size of the mandible on the left compared to that on the right side. Then we came to this type of infection which is known as chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis or chromo and uh, this is an idiopathic inflammatory disorder affects the uh, children and young adults similar to the previously mentioned one and 85% of the cases are seen in females. The typical presentation is a young adult with chronic multifocal bone pain. And this, uh, they, may be, they may be sometimes a fever, weight loss, lethargy, but they are uncommon. If you uh, uh, take a biopsy from the osseous lesion and you will not see any uh, organism. Uh, sometimes they, they thought that uh, this uh, uh, type of osteomyelitis is of autoimmune etiology. Uh, the most common sites to be affected are the uh, metaphysis of the tibia, but uh, the literature considered the clavicular involvement is characteristic as is this site or clavicular uh, involvement is uncommon for uh, hematogenous osteomyelitis. Then uh, this is one of the uh, findings that I have seen frequently uh, in the literature. And you got there is a significant increase in the size and the density of the medial part of the, uh, of the clavicle. And these are the typical locations of the disease, the met metaphysis or a metaphysial equivalence of the bone, symmetrical anterior chest wall, long tubular bones and clavicle, spine, pelvis, sacroiliac joints, ribs, sternum, scapulae, mandible, hands, and feet. And this is an example of uh, uh, chromo in the, in the mandible. There is uh, extensive areas of bone sclerosis and uh, alternating with areas of osteolysis. And how, you ca how can you uh, uh, suspect the possibility of chromo in, 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 in a certain patient? And number one, according to the clinical, if there is chronic bone, bone pain, then uh, if you got a biopsy and the culture is negative for any uh, organism, if there is a particular affection of the uh, clavicle, the <coughs> uh, 
uh, the presence of systemic inflammatory features like inflammatory uh, bowel disease. And uh, sometimes they thought that uh, this technique, which is known as whole body MRI, can help to scan the whole body for the areas of possible uh, involvement. And uh, the findings at the uh, whole body MRI include bone marrow edema, Grossier reaction, soft tissue edema, extension across the, the physis, and the areas of uh, contrast enhancement. Then uh, the uh, whole body uh, bone scan also can help in the uh, detection of the areas affected by chronic recurrent multifocal uh, osteomyelitis. And I think you are able to see this particular affection of the right clavicle and also to a lesser extent the left clavicle and some of the uh, metaphyseal parts of the uh, uh, of the long bones then uh, the findings uh, that can support the diagnosis of hematogenous osteomyelitis over chromo are uh, then these findings, by these findings, you suspect that this is not chromo, but hematogenous osteomyelitis. If there are fluid collections, if there are abscesses, if there are fistulous tracts, bony sequestera, and, uh, 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 and the bony scan or the MRI uh, uh, may show multifocal uptake in, in this disease but the localized uptake in hematogenous osteomyelitis. In um, MRI is, is preferred, of course, in the children uh, because of the radiation. Then uh, the treatment of chromo is by nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive drugs. This is uh, a patient with uh, normal X-ray of the ankle. The MRI showed uh, bone marrow edema of the distal uh, fibula and the tibia on both sides, and also bone marrow edema of the distal femur and the proximal tibia on both sides. And according to the literature, the differential diagnosis will include an infiltrative process like leukemia, but the distribution and the, the symmetrical appearance of the and the uh, proximal femoral sparing are against the diagnosis of leukemia. Also, the diagnosis of Gaucher disease, there is a normal uh, radiographs and uh, make Gaucher disease uh, less likely than they thought of uh, the possibility of chromo and they have the biopsy which yielded inflammatory cells only, uh, but no organism and on this uh, findings, they reached the diagnosis of uh, chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis. And this is another case, and you see the affection of the proximal femora, and you got some lesions in the, in the sacrum and the iliac bone, and also in the vertebrae. Then we came to the tuberculous osteomyelitis, which uh, usually affects the extremities, including the small bones of the hands and the feet. In, uh, in, in the children, whenever you see this lesion, which is uh, an osteolytic lesion that has crossed the physial blade into the epiphysis, and uh, this is considered one of the uh, pathognomonic features of TB osteomyelitis. And um, uh, since the uh, biogenic osteomyelitis do not usually cross the physis, but the uh, tuberculous osteomyelitis can do so. And this is another example of uh, uh, tuberculous osteomyelitis. It is not common for TB to produce berosteal reaction, but in this case, in an, uh, an inflammatory focus associated with a berosteal reaction. Isolated the TB osteomyelitis without TB arthritis is rare because the tuberculous uh, osteomyelitis can extend into the adjacent joints and in 30% it affects the hip or knee and 20% may affect other uh, joints. One form of 
uh, TB of the skeleton is what is known as uh, TB ductilitis or the spina ventosa, which is a painless involvement of the short bones of the hands and feet in children. And the X-ray may show soft tissue swelling and periosteal reaction. And uh, the uh, bone is uh, is it, it expanded and uh, uh, gradually it will be destroyed and became uh, necrotic with the formation of uh, the sequester. Then uh, this is an example of uh, TB ductilitis or what is known as spina ventosa. Of course, this can be easily differentiated from inchondromas, for example, by the clinical picture of the, of the patient and also by the appearance of the lesion, which is not a pure uh, osteolytic uh, lesion as you can see in inchondroma, and there is no matrix calcification as seen in inchondroma. The differential diagnosis of the TB ductilitis include syphilis, biogenic infection, fungal infection, leukemia, thyroid, hypo, uh, hemoglobinosis, hemoglobinosis, and the hyperparathyroidism in low, that's uh, the, brain, uh, the brown tumor. This is the difference between biogenic osteomyelitis and TB osteomyelitis. The biogenic osteomyelitis is acute and rapid. Tuberculous osteomyelitis is a progressive disease. It, uh, uh, biogenic osteomyelitis is extensive with diaphyseal involvement, and this is focal when it may invade the joint and rarely involve the diaphysis. Epiphyseal affection is uncommon in biogenic osteomyelitis but common in tuberculous osteomyelitis. The bony changes destruction and the sclerosis but in TB, destruction and osteoporosis. Periosteal reaction is common in biogenic osteomyelitis, but uncommon in TB osteomyelitis. The sequestra are common and large, and they are in TB uncommon and small. Then we came to a, a disease which is known as transient synovitis of the hip. And I have explained this uh, in uh, a lecture of a, a adolescent hip, but here this uh, transient uh, synovitis is a self-limiting acute inflammatory condition affecting the, the synovial lining of the of the hip, and this may result in hip pain, and usually seen in the age between three to eight years with uh, some recognized male predilection. Over 90% of the patient may have uh, hip joint effusion, and uh, from its name, it is due to uh, synovitis, which is uh, transient, meaning that it is self-limiting and it may heal spontaneously. The exact etiology is unknown, and the viral etiology or trauma are suspected and the, the radiographic features are non-specific and all what you can see by ultrasound ct and the mri is just the joint effusion and sometimes if you may inject contrast material especially on mri and you may got uh, synovial thickening and enhancement then the imaging findings of uh, transient synovitis include hip joint effusion and synovial thickening and um, sometimes we may get contralateral uh, joint effusion and uh, also uh, you may have some uh, inflammation and enhancement in the surrounding uh, soft tissues of the joint but the bone is not affected with normal uh, bone marrow and the, the management is usually conserved and this is a, an example a female child eight years old with uh, hip joint effusion the bone marrow signal is uh, is uh, within normal and also the surrounding muscles are within normal another example of uh, transient synovitis on the right hip and you see a synovial effusion 
and uh, actually you you are not able to appreciate synovial thickening unless you inject contrast material to see the degree of synovial thickening and uh, enhancement then we came to the juvenile rheumatoid uh, arthritis or uh, the juvenile idiopathic arthritis this is one of the most common chronic arthritic diseases of the childhood the estimated incidence is about uh, 13 per 100,000 per uh, annually then uh, uh, symptoms for uh, this disease to be diagnosed the symptoms must start before the age of 16 years and the females are much are more affected than uh, males in, uh, in this uh, disease you may got oligo or body articular arthritis of more than six weeks and uh, uh, the diagnosis this is an essential feature to settle up this uh, diagnosis the presentation may be acute or gradual and the symptoms may be worse in the morning but may present throughout the day intermittent fever a migratory light pink skin rash may be seen like this and a battle is then uh, the uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis may present by soft tissue swelling osteopenia uh, narrowing of the joint space bone erosions and uh, gross uh, disturbance in the form of epiphyseal overgross or ballooning active synovitis joint subluxation and the cervical spine you got atlantoaxial subluxation odontoid erosion and ankylosis especially of the facet joints then uh, this is an example which is not uh, so much different from the previously mentioned disease which is the uh, uh, transient synovitis then you got uh, in the T2 weighted image, and you, you may see normal findings, but the, uh, the this is the appearance of a joint effusion. And the, as I have mentioned, you are not able to appreciate the, the synovial thickening unless you uh, inject contrast material. And in the contralateral joint, you also may see some of the uh, joint effusion and um, uh, you remember in the lecture of uh, arthropathies i have mentioned that, that one of the uh, features of rheumatoid arthritis in the juvenile form uh, is the presence of rice bodies which uh, uh, represents some uh, debris inside the synovial uh, fluid if you inject the contrast material and you can appreciate the degree of uh, synovial thickening and uh, enhancement then uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis uh, rheumatoid belongs to this uh, group of category of, of arthritis and um, in order to diagnose juvenile idiopathic arthritis there should be an onset in a patient less than 16 years old and uh, the condition lasts for more than six weeks and the origin is unknown and what is the role of imaging in such conditions is to diagnose the presence of arthritis by the presence of inflammation of the synovium intracynovial fluid that may be some erosive changes in the uh, opposing surfaces of the uh, joint then to exclude uh, arthritis mimickers as uh, osteoid osteoma causing pain leukemia and avascular necrosis early diagnosis is uh, uh, important because uh, if you initiate treatment be before joint damage this will be uh, this will help to maintain the joint function and prevent its uh, its damage then juvenile uh, idiopathic arthritis is a form of arthritis that should be detected before the age of 16 and the uh, symptoms are lasting for more than six uh, weeks and then you do not identify 
a specific uh, cause. The X-rays will help to exclude uh, other causes, and uh, the X-rays are not recommended for uh, regular follow-up. Ultrasound is a very good tool, and it allows, as I have mentioned, the dynamic scanning. MRI is better for looking for the uh, the synovium. Then, uh, in this uh, in this type of arthritis, you got synovial inflammation, and you got synovial uh, thickening and enhancement, and this can be appreciated very well by MRI. If you use the Doppler ultrasound, then you may got uh, uh, some uh, vascularity, but in many cases you may not see this uh, vascularity. The constant finding is joint effusion and the edematous changes of the very articular uh, soft tissues. And here, uh, and this uh, foot, and you got uh, some uh, insulitis of the plantar fascia. Here you got some thickening of the plantar fascia and the abnormal signal in this T2 weighted image. In cases of juvenile idiopathic arthritis, you may got bone marrow edema and the periostitis, which uh, uh, can differentiate this from the transient uh, synovitis, which is a disease localized uh, for or localized to the synovium. Bone marrow edema is an important uh, finding that may predict the development of bone erosion later on. In the children, the uh, prognostic significance of bone marrow edema is not established and uh, you know that bone marrow edema is only detected by uh, MRI. Ensocytis is inflammation at the tendon or ligament attachment to the, uh, to the bone. Periostitis or periosteal reaction is frequently seen in the very articular areas of the hands and feet. Then uh, periostitis causes enlargement and squaring of the affected bones. This is an example of uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis affecting the wrist joint with some destruction of the carpal bones, and uh, you may feel that there is some bony ankylosis of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the intercarpal joints, and um, this uh, has a, a close appearance to the rheumatoid arthritis, which is seen. In, uh, in adults, and uh, uh, sometimes you may uh, mistake this for rheumatoid arthritis, but you remember, for the diagnosis of juvenile idiopathic arthritis, there should not be a known uh, cause of this arthritic change. And this is another example where you got uh, uh, some uh, uh, swelling of the very uh, articular soft tissues and the enlargement of the of the epiphysis and uh, widening of the joint space and uh, these appearances may simulate the uh, hemophilic arthropathy that I will explain in few minutes. Then we came to the septic arthritis which means infection of the joint by uh, bacteria and this will result in significant uh, swelling of the joint and severe inflammatory uh, signs, as you can see here. Then uh, the risk factors for septic arthritis are the presence of bacteremia, old age, immune compromised status, rheumatoid arthritis, intra-articular injections of contrast or uh, drugs, and uh, prosthetic uh, joints like uh, partial uh, or total uh, joint replacement. Then in absence of uh, trauma or instrumentation, the cause is blood borne. And then Staph aureus, as usual, is the most commonly isolated organism. Then uh, the commonly affected joints being the shoulder, the hip, and the knee. And I, in my opinion, the hip is the most common one clinically uh, or seen in the clinical practice. 
Uh, also, the sternoclavicular and sacroiliac joints may be seen, especially in intravenous drug abusers. And the patient will complain of acute inflammatory symptoms with pain, tenderness, swelling, redness, and high fever. And this, this is a good example for the, uh, the progress of uh, septic arthritis in the hip. At first, the x-rays will, uh, will appear uh, normal, as you can see here. Then you may got uh, some uh, uh, displacement of the fat planes indicating the presence of joint effusion. And also you may see some uh, osteopenia due to uh, reactive hyperemia. Then after uh, cartilage destruction, the joint space will start to be uh, narrowed. Then uh, followed by cartilage destruction, there is destruction of the cortical bone and you got erosive changes on the uh, both articular surfaces of the joint in, in the acetabulum as well as in the, uh, in the uh, femoral head. Then if these uh, changes are not treated, you got uh, sclerosis of the uh, joint surfaces. And finally, you may end by deformities and ankylosis of the, of the joint. And uh, sometimes you may use the ultrasound to aspirate uh, some of the joint content for culture and the sensitivity tests. 90% of the patients will uh, recover with appropriate uh, antibiotic therapy. And uh, this is an example of uh, septic arthritis of the right hip joint with uh, uh, narrowed joint space, erosive changes of the acetabulum and maybe of the uh, femoral head. Uh, sometimes in the literature they, uh, 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 they use this sign which is Waldenstrom sign where you got some uh, widening of the inferior medial aspect of the uh, joint uh, space. And this is a, a classic appearance of the uh, septic arthritis of the metatarsophalangeal joint of the fifth toe which is frequently seen in diabetics, where you got erosive changes, perosteal reaction, and in order for this to be uh, diagnosed as arthritis, there should be a changes in the opposing articular surface on the uh, other joint line. Then uh, uh, these are the causes, hematogenous spread or direct extension from osteomyelitis or needles or trauma or uh, secondary to uh, surgery. And in this example, you got uh, hip joint effusion, which is seen well in the T2-weighted image. After injection of contrast material, then you got uh, uh, synovial thickening and enhancement. At this stage, uh, you may call this synovitis, and uh, this synovitis may be of the transient form or maybe of the septic form and uh, if left untreated it may progress to uh, uh, cartilage destruction followed by uh, 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 bone destruction and um, in this stage ultrasound is good to have a sample of this fluid for culture to uh, ensure that there is no an inflammatory organism or a, a type of uh, bacteria. Then uh, in, in the X-ray, as I have mentioned, you got soft tissue swelling around the joint. Then there is rapid destruction of the cartilage and bone, uh, narrowing of the joint space, sclerosis, then bony ankylosis. And here in the, in the shoulder, you, you see the anchors of previous surgery, and uh, uh, you got the swelling of the soft tissues, osteolytic lesions in the femoral head, and you may be able to notice some of the gas shadows within the uh, soft tissues around the shoulder. And here also you may see the same changes with gas shadows within the uh, soft tissues. And aspiration of this joint yielded uh, bus and the diagnosis of septic arthritis is settled. Actually, CT is good in this particular uh, disease where it can see the extent of uh, destructive changes in the, in the hip joint 
and the, the extent of uh, collections and abscesses within the joint itself as well as the bone debris and also the uh, uh, the uh, state of the joint if it is uh, dislocated or subluxated or uh, migrated like this and you see the uh, hem the femoral head has migrated upward and is uh, false articulating with the uh, ilium and uh, another example of uh, septic arthritis and you see uh, the collection of, of uh, fluid inside the joint and these fluids are marginally enhancing denoting the presence of abscesses also you see the migration of the femoral head and also the varus deformity uh, also and here is the axial images where you got uh, thick marginally enhancing collections denoting abscesses areas of destructive bony changes representing the uh, uh, osteomyelitis and another example of severe osteomyelitis and uh, septic arthritis around the ankle there is destructive changes in the talus and the calcaneus as well as in the distal part of the tibia and fibula with destruction of the articular surface and extensive periarticular soft tissue swellings then sometimes uh, you got uh, uh, in septic arthritis you got total resorption of the bone especially the femoral head and maybe uh, most of the uh, acetabulum resulting in this uh, in this appearance ultrasound as i have mentioned is one of the best imaging modalities for uh, number one detection of joint effusion number two the uh, detection of rice bodies or the uh, debris inside the collection number three the assessment of uh, vascularity and number four and you got, got an aspirate from the joint content uh, in a real time and uh, a very quick uh, procedure and uh, that can help you for uh, assessment of the underlying organism and this is by MRI uh, septic arthritis of the right hip uh, coronal T1 and coronal stair you got uh, bone marrow changes in the femoral head and the acetabulum marked narrowing of the joint space uh, soft tissue swelling and edema surrounding the uh, the hip joint and this is also another example in the T1 in the T2 and uh, this is a stair and this is T2 with the image and you got the uh, the stension of the joint the capsule by fluid bone marrow edema of the acetabulum and the femoral head and this is an indication of uh, arthritis not an osteomyelitis because of the affection of the uh, both uh, sides of the joint space then this is an end stage of septic arthritis where you got resorption of the bone and the total ankylosis of the remaining part of the femoral neck to the iliac bone then uh, we uh, came to the uh, tuberculous arthritis and this is according to the literature is never a primary lesion it is almost secondary to pulmonary or, or uh, tb lymphadenopathy and it is usually a monoarticular occurring at any age with no uh, sex predilection the most common site for uh, tuberculous arthropathy is the spine of course but uh, the hip is one of the uh, joints that is frequently affected by septic and tuberculous arthritis also the knee ankle sacroiliac shoulder elbow and wrist joints may be uh, may be affected and the uh, uh, smears from the, the the joint may be negative for acid fast bacilli but synovial fluid culture is uh, positive in about 80 percent of the of the cases and uh, the x-ray you may got this uh, femister triad which uh, include very articular osteoporosis then uh, peripherally located bone erosions and the progressive decrease in the 
joint space as you can see here in this uh, hip joint and in the early stage of the synovitis you got uh, very articular osteoporosis you may got joint space widening due to effusion and you may got some uh, uh, some erosive changes exactly similar to those seen in the uh, biogenic arth arthritis then in the latest stage which is the stage of erosion and destruction you got uh, gradual narrowing of the joint space with destruction of the articular cartilage and you got erosions on also uh, subluxation and even dislocations of the joint and you see in this bilateral uh, uh, TB of the hip joints with dislocated uh, to, uh, hips uh, then this may be followed by fibrous ankylosis to uh, 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 according to the literature bony ankylosis is considered uncommon in cases of uh, TB uh, sometimes you got bone atrophy and uh, atrophic arthropathy, which uh, is seen in the shoulder joint, and this type of TB is known as caries sicca. And according to the literature, we have three types of shoulder TB. Type 1, which is known as caries sicca, where you got marked wasting and painful restriction of the movement of the, uh, of the shoulder. And uh, type 2 is known as caries exudata, and there is a swelling of the joint with the formation of multiple cold abscesses and sinus tracts. And uh, type 3 is known as caries mobile, where the active movements are restricted, but the passive movements are uh, preserved. And this is an example of caries sicca, where you got destructive changes in the articular surfaces, and you got uh, some atrophic changes of the surrounding muscles. You are not able to see the shadow of the deltoid muscle, for example. Then uh, in MRI, you, you may see uh, hyperintensity in the T1 and hypointensity in the T2 with a significant contrast enhancement. And the, the uh, low signal in the T2 is due to fibrosis and necrosis and the uh, blood uh, byproducts, which are considered rare in other forms of arthrobasis. Then uh, MRI can also assess any associated abnormalities with tuberculous arthropathy, like uh, affection of the bone, affection of the muscles, affection of the skin and the subcutaneous tissues, the presence of baroarticular abscesses, the presence of tenosynovitis, skin ulcerations and sinus tracts and this is an example of TB arthritis of the left hip where you got the destructive changes in the femoral head and the acetabulum as well as significant edematous changes of the surrounding muscles and this is an example of TB arthritis of the ankle joint where you got the lesion in the distal part of the uh, tibia and you got inflammation of the synovium of the uh, ankle as well as the uh, uh, inflammation of the surrounding uh, soft tissues. In this uh, example, you got destructive changes in the wrist joint with uh, destruction of some of the uh, carpal bones. On MRI, you got extensive bone marrow edema destructive changes in the carpal bones and also you, you got fluid in the distal radio ulnar joint as well as in the intercarpal joints together with fluid along the uh, extensor uh, tendon sheath which may indicate the presence of uh, tenosynovitis. In uh, one of the uh, well-known manifestations of tuberculous arthritis is the osteoporosis resulting in hazy joint line and in order to appreciate this finding this is the normal appearance of the ankle where you got the well definition of the cortical outline of the talus and the tibia but here you see the hazy irregular shaggy outline of the articular surfaces together with some uh, soft tissue swelling which is considered uh, a sign of uh, tuberculous arthritis 
also articular cartilage uh, destruction is uh, one of the late findings so the joint space narrowing is also a late finding in uh, TB arthritis and uh, uh, if you look here and there is considerable destructive changes in the in the hip joint and after uh, total hip replacement then you got uh, appreciable healing of the uh, iliac uh, bone lesion and uh, some new bone formation uh, around the, the processes then uh, we came to the hemophilic arthropathy and uh, you know that we have two types of hemophilia hemophilia a and b which is six linked uh, recessive disease seen only in males and uh, is associated with bony changes while hemophilia c is not six linked seen in males and females with uh, almost no uh, bony changes and uh, hemophilic arthropathy may be a mono or oligoarticular. Uh, the presence of hemorrhage inside the, the joint will result in uh, a swelling of the joint. There may be some fluid, fluid level due to the presence of synovial fluid and uh, blood. Uh, the presence of chronic heme arthrosis and hyperemia may uh, lead to uh, uh, enlargement of the uh, epiphysis and uh, deformities of the uh, gross, uh, gross plate. Then uh, in the plain x-ray you may got very articular soft tissue swelling which is very dense compared to the adjacent muscles due to the presence of, uh, of blood. Then uh, it is uh, usual for the same joint to be uh, involved multiple times by intra-articular uh, intra bleeding. Then um, the uh, synovial hyperplasia and the chronic inflammation with fibrosis as well as hemoarthrosis are the pathologic underlying findings of this uh, particular type of arthropathy. And uh, synovial masses will erode the cartilage and the, the subchondral bone. The most commonly joint affected is the knee, then the elbow, ankle, hip, and uh, shoulder. Uh, whenever you have uh, in, an imaging modality, which is in this case MRI, which is the best, because it is able to see uh, the synovial thickening, and is also to see the uh, blood byproducts, including the hemosiderin, by its uh, characteristic low signal intensity in all uh, pulse sequences. And you can see these hemosiderin depositions within the, uh, the joint. Also, if you inject contrast material, you may got enhancement of the synovium due to irritative synovitis. You may got joint effusion, simple fluid rather than blood, and you may got articular cartilage. Uh, erosion. Then uh, there are some of the, uh, let's say, uh, pathognomonic X-ray findings, particularly in the in the knee joint. And one of them, as you all know, is the widening of the intercondylar notch due to intercondylar uh, bleeding, and uh, the increased density of the very articular soft tissues, the extension of the joint uh, capsule by hemorrhage. Uh, this use osteoporosis due to limited uh, joint mobility in chronic synovitis with uh, cartilage destruction and joint space narrowing. Then we have four sites for bleeding, intercondylar, intraosseous, subosteal, and epiphyseal. Intercondylar will lead to widening of the notch, which is considered one of the pathognomonic signs of hemophilia. Then inter Intraosseous hemorrhage will lead to a osteolytic lesion, which is known as hemophilic pseudotumor. Subperosteal hemorrhage may cause perosteal elevation and subperosteal newborn formation. And epiphyseal hemorrhage may result in premature fusion and deformities. And then this is a hemophilic arthropathy of the knee in an advanced stage where you got the development of uh, secondary osteoarthritic changes. Then how can you know that uh, this uh, joint 
is affected by uh, hemophilia before it has developed this extensive degenerative changes. It is the history and the, the, previous, uh, the previous films that can help you to predict the uh, diagnosis. Then, um, of course, uh, the, the sign of widening of the notch may be lost by the time of the development of these extensive uh, osteoarthritic changes. And uh, this patient is uh, uh, also uh, uh, affected the, the elbow and the, the ankle joint, but uh, the ankle here is the less one to be affected. And the, you know, one of the characteristic findings is the uh, Taylor slanting or the uh, medial uh, sloping of the tibia of the Taylor articular surface may be uh, one of the diagnostic criteria. But of course, whenever you have MRI and you see these uh, uh, big uh, masses of persistent uh, low signal intensity in all bulk sequences, and if you inject contrast material, these masses will not enhance and they are able to differentiate this from pigmented velonodular synovitis, since uh, the synovitis will enhance if you inject contrast uh, material. The hemophilic pseudotumor is one of the rare complications of hemophilia, which uh, is seen in uh, less than 2% of the hemophilic uh, patients, and uh, it may develop in the muscle or the, the bone of the pelvis, especially, or the lower limbs. And this is because uh, that the pelvis and lower limbs have abundant uh, blood supply. This is uh, usually a big lesion, which uh, is usually unilocular or multilocular, uh, osteolytic expanding of variable uh, size. It can affect the metaphysis, the diaphysis, and the epiphysis with these manifestations in the plain film, including endosteal scalloping, very uh, lesional osteo uh, or very lesional sclerosis, and cortical bone uh, thinning or thickening, trabeculations and septations together with uh, pathological fractures. A hypo-intense rim of the pseudotumor is seen in T2 and T1 uh, weighted images due to fibrosis and hemocytrin deposition. And this is an example of a hemophilic pseudotumor in the forearm where you got significant destructive changes and expansion of the ulna. And uh, uh, you can see the huge soft tissue, uh, soft tissue component. And this is the hemophilic pseudotumor of the, of the pelvis. And the blind X-ray, you see a dense soft tissue shadow around the joint. And here you see uh, an, a, a collection that has a thick margin with some internal uh, hyperdense foci or possible calcification and also erosion of the adjacent iliac bone. This is the MRI of the same case showing the uh, low signal intensity rim of hemocytrin and fibrosis around the, this hemophilic pseudotumor. Then we came to the uh, Charcot joint, which uh, is known as neuropathic arthropathy. And uh, this joint has uh, three underlying uh, pathologies, the ischemia, the infection, and the disturbed uh, sensation. Uh, this Charcot joint is uh, commonly seen in diabetic patients because they have the three uh, factors contributing to this, the development of this uh, Charcot joint. Charcot joint is uh, typically unilateral and may be bilateral in about 20% of the cases. The causes of uh, Charcot joint include diabetes, syringomyelia, some of the uh, neurologic uh, uh, problems like spinal trauma, brain injury, also leprosy, neurological diseases, congenital insensitivity to pain, and intraarticular steroid uh, injections. We have two types of Charcot joints, the atrophic form, which is uh, the most common and occurs earlier and has an acute progression with resorption of the ends of the affected bones, joint destruction with resorption 
of the fragments and there is no uh, osteosclerosis or osteophytes and this occurs in the non-weight bearing joints of the upper limb like you see here in the elbow and the hypertrophic uh, form and this is a slowly progressive disease where the sensory nerves are affected and you got joint destruction with uh, very articular debris and the fragmentations uh, widen then destroy joint space uh, osteosclerosis osteophytes no osteoporosis unless the development of uh, acute infection then the joint looks like it has as if it has been hit by this hammer then you got significant destructive changes bone sclerosis and uh, joint derangement with uh, you know from the literature the six d's that are characteristic of uh, uh, shark joint density a change uh, meaning that there is subchondral osteopenia or sclerosis destruction osseous fragmentation and resorption debris and distension of the joint due to effusion disorganization and dislocation joint malalignment due to uh, ligamentous laxity and you see this ankle joint in the frontal and lateral view an MRI, the T1 weighted image will show low signal intensity, ulcerated skin, some soft tissue gases, and soft tissue swellings. If you inject contrast material, most of the uh, areas will enhance, apart from the areas of necrosis and uh, uh, bus collections. Then, uh, in the stir uh, image, you may see uh, bone marrow edema and soft tissue edema as well. Later stages will lead to loss of demarcation of the cortical bone and cortical destructions. Uh, if uh, superimposed osteomyelitis has occurred, then MRI may show the presence of uh, sinus tract, bone marrow edema, uh, uh, some soft tissue edema, uh, marginally enhancing lesion denoting abscesses, joint uh, erosion, and this ghost sign, which uh, uh, indicates that uh, the margin of the lesion will, will not appear uh, clearly unless you inject the patient with contrast material in order uh, to uh, enhance the uh, bone marrow edema, then you, are, uh, you, you will see the, the margins of a collection or necrotic bone more better. Then, uh, this is an example of uh, Charcot joint, which, uh, uh, as I have mentioned, is the uh, sequelae of three uh, superimposed uh, factors, which are the loss of sensation and the, the decrease of the blood supply and the super added infection. There are some of the of the measurements that uh, can help you to. Uh, see the changes in the in the food especially in these uh, patients with charcoal joint and this is the mirror's angle which is the angle between the axis of the talus and the, the axis of the metatarsal bone this angle will uh, will be widened whenever the foot is collapsed and also the angle which is known as the cuboid height and here you, you draw a line from the undersurface of the calcaneus to the cuboid bone then you measure the angle uh, with the uh, sole of the foot and uh, the, if the uh, there is some uh, uh, flat foot let us say which uh, will occur due to destructive changes in the intertarsal joints and this angle will be uh, reversed and uh, you see this angle is by positive degrees, now it is by negative degrees. The, these, the literature divides the, uh, the foot and the ankle into uh, five regions. And uh, they indicated that the most common two regions to be affected by shark joints are region two and region three. This is region number one and this is number four and this is number five. This is an extensive 
destructive changes of the ankle joint with uh, many debris and uh, uh, almost total erosion of the talus and the most of the superior surface of the calcaneus as well as the distal part of the tibia and the fibula. And this is also the, the appearance by MRI. You got uh, uh, soft tissue inflammation with uh, phlegmon formation, let us say that. And uh, one of the uh, best values of this MRI was to detect well-formed abscesses. And they are of uh, interest for the surgeons to be uh, evacuated either in the uh, diabetic foot or in, in the presence of uh, charcoal joint. And then we have the, some few uh, remaining issues about the inflammation of the muscles and the inflammation of the skin. And we start first by the inflammation or the infection of the muscles, which is known as infectious myositis or bio uh, myositis, which is seen in young adults. And these are the risk factors like HIV, muscle trauma, cellulitis, infected insect bites, and uh, the injection of drugs, diabetics, uh, diabetic patients, and also the staph aureus is the commonly encountered uh, organism. Then uh, the uh, inflamed muscles may uh, transmit the infection to the adjacent bone, resulting in osteomyelitis or adjacent joint, resulting in uh, septic arthritis. Then uh, biomyositis is characterized by uh, three stages. The invasive stage where there is edema in the affected muscles leading to pain. Then the subjective stage where the patient develops fever and the later stage which is life threatening and may lead to, to toxicity and symptoms and the sepsis. Then uh, here you got uh, uh, biomyositis with multiple marginally enhanced abscesses within uh, different muscle groups of the thigh and the, the, the diffuse uh, high signal represents the uh, uh, muscle edema. And this is infectious myositis in a diabetic patient where you got inflammation of the vastus lateralis and adductor magnus muscle. They are not clearly seen in the T1 weighted image, but they are well appreciated in the stir image and also after injection of contrast. What is important is to detect well-formed marginally enhancing abscesses, which are not present in this case, and also to assess the integrity of the bone, which is also healthy in this case. Then here you got infectious myositis with the formation of an abscess, where you can see the marginally enhanced lesion. The, the MR findings will include, or the, uh, imaging findings in general, diffuse muscle swelling, a stranding of the subcutaneous fat, marginally enhancing abscesses, obliteration of the intermuscular fat planes. If it is spread to the bone, you got osteomyelitis. If it affects the artery or the vein, you get vascular thrombosis. And if it is in the leg, you may got compartment syndrome. Soft tissue abscesses are similar to any abscesses anywhere in the body. And you got a collection of bars which is surrounded by a capsule and this capsule is uh, enhanced if you inject contrast material in the CT or MRI. Then uh, you see an example of multiple abscesses intra-abdominal and also in the uh, back muscles. Then we get, get to the dermatomyositis which is an autoimmune inflammatory myositis as well as inflammation of the skin, dermatomyositis. This is important to differentiate from other forms that I will mention now. Then uh, <clears throat> this is closely related polymyositis, which is which carries an increased risk of uh, malignancy. Then we have two types of dermatomyositis, the juvenile form, which is seen in the children, and the other form which is seen in, in adults around the age of 50 years. The presentation by uh, symmetrical proximal myopathy with skin changes, as you can see here. The skin is dusky, red uh, rashes over the face, arm, hands, legs, and 
<coughs> with development of babules, and you see this, uh, the, these babules. Sometimes the patient may present by dysphagia, myalgia, fever, weight loss, and other, uh, other features. Then uh, uh, there is a six-fold increased risk of malignancy in dermatomyositis. And these are the factors which contribute to the increased risk. Number one, elderly patient, the presence of dysphagia, the presence of accelerated onset of the disease, the presence of skin necrosis and cutaneous vasculitis, the increased creatine, uh, creatine kinase levels, the increased ECR and C-reactive protein, the presence of interstitial lung disease or inflammatory arthropathy or Reynolds syndrome. <clears throat> then uh, this, this disease is easily diagnosed from the brain films by the presence of sheets of dystrophic calcification in the muscles and the, the soft tissues. And uh, this is known as calcinosis universalis. Calcinosis universalis means that there is calcium in the soft tissues, uh, in the skin, as well as in the, in the muscles. The calcium is in the form of sheet-like uh, densities and uh, may be seen everywhere in the, in the body and uh, may be associated with acroosteolysis, which, uh, which means resorption of the distal phalangeal tufts. And uh, in some patients, the barium swallow may show the decreased peristalsis, like exactly you see in scleroderma, which is one of this, uh, of this category, as I will mention. Then uh, MRI will show hyperintense signal throughout the affected muscles due to myositis, which means that there is some sort of edema. The calcific areas will appear of low signal, but uh, the brain films are better for detection of calcification rather than an MRI. And here and you can see the, this, is the, uh, uh, this is the appearance of the normal thigh muscles, and this is the appearance of the uh, muscles affected by dermatomyositis. And here you, you can see the diffuse uh, bone, uh, muscle edema with, um, uh, you may feel that there is some uh, subcutaneous edema as well. Then uh, this is the uh, reconstructed image which show the extensive edematous changes or uh, edematous changes of the SI muscles with relative sparing of the uh, leg muscles according to the literature. Uh, patients with dermatomyositis may have uh, a chest involvement and the, the pulmonary changes are almost similar to those seen in usual interstitial pneumonia, which uh, means that there are extensive interstitial opacities with honeycombing direction bronchitis, and this may be seen in about uh, uh, 45% of patients with uh, dermatomyositis. And uh, calcinosis universalis means that you got calcium in the uh, skin uh, or the subcutaneous tissues and also in the muscles. And then one third of these cases are associated with scleroderma, dermatomyositis, polymyositis, and the systemic lobus rhizomatosis. Then you may got subcutaneous calcification extending along the, uh, the facial planes with possible tendon and uh, ligament uh, involvement. You remember that there is a form of uh, calcinosis which is known as tumoral calcinosis, and this is uh, have been explained before. It, uh, it, it, it appears in the form of masses in the uh, of uh, soft tissue calcification related to the joints which are uh, not affected uh, usually by this uh, these masses but here you got sheets of calcium not masses and this is a good example where you see extensive uh, subcutaneous soft tissue calcification in the chest wall and also you can see the same changes in the uh, 
uh, muscles and the, the subcutaneous areas of the anterior abdominal wall and the, some of the posterior abdominal wall. Then what is calcinosis uh, circumscripta? And this means that there is calcium deposition in the subcutaneous uh, tissues. And it is considered a localized form of calcinosis uh, universalis and uh, commonly seen in women. And the most of the cases are idiopathic and commonly present in the hands and feet. There is some association with Reynolds phenomena, scleroderma, and the dermatomyositis in about 40% of the cases. Patients present by firm white dermal blakes or nodules. Do you see these uh, nodules of calcium that are present in the subcutaneous area? And here you can see uh, the classic appearance of uh, calcium deposited in the soft tissues of uh, scleroderma and uh, you may also see resorption of the uh, phalangeal, phalangeal tufts. Then uh, uh, isonophilic uh, fasciitis means that there is inflammation or uh, let us say and this is a, a connective tissue disorder of the fascia. It is not affecting the muscles. It can be seen in, in any age and is also uh, well recognized in uh, females, especially of the uh, extremities. Uh, other supportive diagnostic features is the presence of peripheral isonophilia, hypergamma globulinemia, and the elevated ESR and C-reactive protein levels. Then you got scleroderma-like cutaneous uh, changes. You may see muscle, muscle, uh, or muscle uh, facial thickening without without myositis, and this is the appearance of the skin. And the changes are usually uh, uh, symmetrical. And the MRI, you got affection of the facial planes, but the muscles are not affected. If you inject contrast material, the the fascia will enhance. If you want to confirm the diagnosis and uh, this will be obtained by biopsy, then the biopsy should be deep enough to include uh, uh, part of the muscles in order to reach the diagnosis and the disease responds well to corticosteroids. Then this is the appearance, uh, MRI T1 post contrast and you got uh, enhancement of the uh, facial planes, but the muscles are uh, are not involved. Then this is also another example. This is the T1, and this is the T2, and this is the T1 post contrast, and you got enhancement and thickening of the facial planes, but the muscles are spared or not affected. Finally, we uh, two a uh, few words about necrotizing fasciitis, which is rapidly progressive and fatal infection with a high mortality rate may reach up to 75 percent of the of the cases the disease affects the uh, deep facial planes the skin and the the, uh, uh, the underlying muscles may be affected it's commonly seen in immune compromised uh, patients uh, like uh, those with hiv infection diabetes cancer, alcoholism, and organ transplant. Uh, uh, sometimes there may be an underlying cause of trauma or uh, retained uh, foreign bodies, for example, and the, the uh, organism in a charge may be polymicrobial, a, a group of organisms, or a single organism, which is commonly the A-type streptococci, which is known as the flesh, eating uh, bacteria. The treatment requires urgent surgical fasciotomy with the deprivement of the necrotic tissue. The blend film may show uh, soft tissue swelling and gas, which is not present in most of the cases. Gas is only seen in a minority uh, of cases. But the value of CT is to uh, show the degree of soft tissue necrosis the presence of uh, internal 
hemorrhage and uh, bus collections and also it is more sensitive than the brain film to detect uh, gases if they are present and uh, these are uh, some of the non-specific findings <coughs> which include asymmetric facial thickening uh, with fat stranding muscle and intermuscular septal edema soft tissue abscesses may be present alhamdulillah rabbil alameen Thank you very much.